Ladies and gentlemen, uh, oh wow, we're down tonight. Uh, we're going to look at one of the strange chapters in um, Revelation. Um, interesting history behind the interpretation of this chapter, uh, but we're going to look at chapter 17. And it looks like in this session of classes that we will get done right on time and I'll finish Revelation and I can go and do some Old Testament book that I feel more comfortable with. Um, the uh, next time I, Todd has me come here. One of the things that uh, is difficult is deciding what's important and what's not. We were talking about this at the table and sometimes when you have multiple ways of looking at a text, you're probably looking at the wrong thing in the text. If I can take it two ways and there's no bad reason why you take it the one way and someone else takes it the other, that's probably not the main point of the text. And a lot of debate, I'm writing, writing right now a booklet or a book. Hard to say when does it become a book and when is it a booklet. I'm writing a booklet on Genesis 1. Now if you want to here are all sorts of controversies between people. You read the books on Genesis 1. But the, the one thing that it seems like to me is that we're usually on those controversies, we're zeroing in on the wrong thing. Um, for me, the, the big point of Genesis 1 is that God is the creator. Things have function. They perform their function. Um, and that the greatest aspect of his creation is man, as man and woman. And uh, not just men, man as males, but man as men and woman. And we are very special to God. And that's, to me, the, the first thing. If someone said, what do you preach on when you preach on that? I preach on, on man. What is man that thou art mindful of him, as Psalm 8 says? Uh, revelation to me, and I've explained this multiple times, the important thing to me is what does it mean to be a person of God? How do I respond to things? I may not know all the little details of the beast and the big beast and the little beast, the beast and the whore, um, and the beast and the false prophet. Now some of that may be because we haven't seen it yet, Maybe we've seen part of it, but we haven't seen all of it yet. But that's not important to me as much as it is to say, how do I respond? How do I act? Now, we are starting what many consider, and I consider, the last part of the book of Revelation. The, um, the 17th through the 22nd chapter forms the end of the book. And if you look on the sheet I gave you today, I have a funny outline at the top, A, B, C, D, E, E prime, D prime, C prime, B prime, A prime. And we're going to look at that first, and then we're going to go through this text, which is just A, on this outline of the book's end. Uh, but this is part A. A whore is the rider on the beast. That's the first thing we'll look at. Then we'll look at an explanation of the beast and the whore. And the third thing, and for some reason the centering didn't come out on the uh, outline, the whore is destroyed by the beast. We have to look at that thing. So we're going to look at this. Now, again, let me state this. I want, to, I want for us to examine what does it mean to be a Christian and what can we expect as Christians? What does God ask of us as Christians? And we will look at that. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we will begin tonight. Father in heaven, we come before you as your people. We pray, Father, that we would understand what it means to be a Christian, that we would be willing to lay down our lives, that we would be faithful in all things, that we would be among those who find peace in spite of what is happening to us in the world. Keep us, Father, from the compromising with the world and compromising with the evil leaders, with the evil governments, with the evil people of this world. May we be kind to them, though, Father. May we um, 
reach out and show them the glory of the Christ. We pray this through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Okay, um, that funny outline, outline of the book's end. Now, I've explained this type of thing before. We've seen it before. This is what we call a chiasm. You don't have to know that word, but that's what it's called in the quote-unquote scholarly circles. Um, what it is is an outline where you start and make a point, and then the last point in your outline is going to mirror that in some ways. The second point will be mirrored at the end, the third point, fourth point, however many points. The biggest one that I know of is the flood story in um, Genesis where it uses this literary structure. It doesn't make it unreal. It just makes it he wants to make a certain point. Now, the important points in the chiasm is the middle, whatever's in the middle. So our important point in the end of the book of Revelation is E and E prime. That's what that little doohickey, that apostrophe, apostrophe, yeah, yeah, apostrophe is there for it. It's to say we are repeating that one, and that's our main point. And we, when we get down to that, we will really emphasize this uh, because it's not some people get the thing, I'm so afraid of the Antichrist. I think this is talking about Antichrist here in some way, shape, or form. But they're so afraid of the Antichrist. No, we should prepare to meet the Christ. Because who is it that's going to give the order to uh, throw Satan in the prison? That's Revelation 20. He's going to be in prison for a thousand years. Who's going to give the order? God is. And who is God? Well, the one who is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, is Jesus. And so uh, that's an important thing. But the other part of that is that the saints, that would include us, especially the ones who have been martyred for the sake of Christ, we get to reign with him. Okay, we, we are going to be his people. Okay, so that's what we're building up to. So we'll... If you watch the, out, the handouts I give you each week, this is going to be the first point. I'm going to put this in, and we're going to say it. We're looking at this part of our outline. Uh, so what we have is a description of the harlot who rides the beast. Oh, my. Um, now, who in the world is the beast? Well, as we see in this chapter and the next chapter, the beast is called Babylon. Now, that is not the name of the final kingdom that we'll see on earth. That is what we call a code name. Throughout the history of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the name Babylon has taken on special meaning. For example, Genesis chapter 10. I didn't put this on. It's on next week's handout. I already started that handout. But uh, in Genesis chapter 10, what was the first great kingdom that appeared on earth in Genesis 1 through 11. What's the first great kingdom? Well, the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel, uh, which is Babylon. That's the Hebrew word for Babylon, Babel. And um, if you go through the Old Testament, for example, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, uh, the king of Assyria, he wants to talk about, Isaiah wants to talk about him, so he calls him, not the king of Assyria, not the king of Nineveh, but he calls him the king of Babel, Babylon. They take up this lament against the king of Babylon. And so uh, sometimes when you don't want to talk about somebody, you'll call them Babylon. Uh, Jeremiah, in chapters 50 and 51, picture the destruction of the actual Babylon, and it was destroyed. It's a ruin today if you go over there little village there or something, but no great empire there. And so, uh, but and then in First Peter, Peter is using the word Babylon to describe somebody somewhere, and he talks about the saints who are in Babylon send you a greeting. Well, most people think, at least they could be wrong, I'll be wrong, but uh, they, they think that he's using it as a code word for Rome. But he doesn't want to talk about that because he, you don't want to start the persecution. When the persecution comes, you accept it, but you don't want to start the persecution uh, of people. And so here he is talking about Babylon. Okay, so um, 
This is the third announcement that Babylon would fall. Now, if he means Rome by this, that would not be the thing you'd want to say. Rome is going to fall. Rome is going to fall. Rome is going to fall. Okay. Uh, you, this is the third announcement. And then the next chapter, we're going to see a detailed study of the fall of Babylon. Okay, so uh, what John sees, and this is um, a more detailed description of uh, this, he see, he, I, then, let's just read the text, I put it down there. Then one of the seven angels, now remember there were seven angels who poured out the bowls of wrath. The bowls of wrath are the one that just brings everything to an end. Uh, he's going back and explaining something that the bowls of wrath symbolized. This angel came and spoke to me saying, come here. I will show you the judgment of the great harlot, or you could translate it whore. It's, sometimes our translations are nicer than uh, the original text, but you could translate this whore. Um, who sits on many waters. Now, that's kind of a strange image. It sits on many waters. He's going to explain that at the end of the chapter. If you look down at the last verse of chapter 17, turn the page in my Bible here. The woman who you saw is the great city. Oh, not that verse. I'm. Why did I... Yeah, 15. He said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes, nations and tongues. See, it's not even literally waters. It's just saying she controls many peoples, nations and peoples. And that. So this harlot um, sits on many waters. Okay. Well, you don't really sit on water. So, uh, obviously, it's a symbol for something, and he explains later the symbol. With whom the kings of the earth com committed acts of immorality. Now, that's usually, immorality is usually sexual things, but it also can cover other aspects of immorality. And those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. Okay, so, it's still... Something strange. And he carried me away in, in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet bee. So, wait, she sits on water, she sits on a scarlet bee. See, this type of literature can give you, if you take it too literally, contradictory images. She sits on water, she sits on a beast. Okay, well, we've seen the beast before in chapter 13. Remember the big beast that comes up out of the sea and the little beast who comes out of the land? Well, we've got another image of the beast. This time, the beast is ridden by a whore. I uh, saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names. Now, if you were living in the first century, which John is, he's right at the end of the first century. It's a, AD 90 to 95, usually people put this right in there. This is pretty late in the first century of the Christian era, the Roman emperors, if you read this, they say, yeah, and then you could list off a whole list, you know, for example, uh, Caesar calls himself Pantocrator, the Almighty. Yeah, right, you're Almighty, yeah, I'll wait until you're dead, <laughs> then you'll meet the Almighty, uh, but they have all sorts of names they used uh, in ancient times, even in modern times. I was reading about one of the little tyrants of our age. Uh, don't use his name. Uh, Rocket Man, you know, the guy in North Korea. You know, I just don't like using his name. But uh, he makes his, some of his people believe he's God. Some of the North Koreans believe he is a deity of some type. Devil, maybe, but uh, but anyway. Uh, so one of the things that uh, world leaders do is they give themselves great titles and that blasphemous names had seven heads and ten horns. Well, if you go back 
and um, seven heads and ten horns, go to Revelation 12. I have this down below, but Revelation 12, verse 3. Um, now, this is that passage that takes us to the birth of the Christ, the, the great child that is to be born. Uh, but then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. Well, Satan, that's one of his images. So this being, whoever the beast is, is very much like Satan. Okay, he's satanic power. And um, yeah. so... Um, the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stone and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of. Now, the outward appearance of this thing is something great. As I mentioned, the early Christians, when they read this, they thought, Rome. And this describes how Rome felt. Oh, look at the glory of these guys, you know, the, the outfits and the, uh, the, the temples and all that. The outward beauty of the thing must have been stunning. But that's also true of other countries. I always wanted to, if I had a time machine, you know, where would you go? Well, you can't have a time machine. But uh, if I had a time machine, I would want to go see ancient Egypt. The gold and the buildings and, and, and the glory of, the, uh, of things. You know, a magnificent place. You know, the little bit we have recovered, if you ever uh, read on King Tut's tomb, one of the few that survived the robbers, Magnificent. And so one of the things that world empires do is they emphasize the outward thing. And they have this great cup. She has this, this harlot. What, what an image here. Has this great cup. But look what it's filled with. Full of abominations and the unclean things of her immorality. And we'll look at that in a moment. But um, and the forehead was na written a name, mystery. And it's not going. To, it's it is a mystery. Um, who was he talking about? And I'm going to give you some answers that people have suggested over time. Mystery, Babylon the Great. Well, that's not literally Babylon, but that's his code word for it. And it, and I doubt that um, any of these people would put. Mother of harlots, mother of, or you know, the mother of whores, and of the abominations of the earth. Now, all of that is what we would call cryptic or hidden. It's really vague as to it fits many things, but what is not vague is what he does to what she does to the saints. Listen to that, what I'll call verse 6a. I divided this in right in the middle of verse 6. Verses are not original to this. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. Intoxicated by killing the saints. Okay. Now, as I go through this opening section, there are certain words that I look at, trying to interpret it, trying to figure it out. Uh, we'll do wor important words, and then we'll look at interpretations. She, this entity, and I hate to call it a person, this entity is called a whore, a harlot. In the Old Testament, that term was used three ways. Number one, it was used for a harlot. I didn't put that one on there. Like Rahab the harlot, you know. Uh, that's what she was. Turned into a good person. She repented. And, um, she was saved from the fall of Jericho. and um, She even got married. She married some Israelite. But she was a harlot. No. Okay, so you, you have that type of thing. But um, two other ways that the term harlot is used. I'm going to look at the second one first. The people of God. 
when they turn utterly against God, utterly immoral, not just sexually, we're not just just dealing with the sexual aspect, but they, they, they have, if you, if you study, they, they have gone after the poor. That's one of the ways that they, God gets furious when his people go after the poor and misuse the poor. You want to infuriate God? That's one of the ways you can do that. Now, um, or you can, you can, how do I want to say this? You can break that commandment, that first commandment, that second commandment, and that third commandment of the Ten Commandments. You'll not have any other gods before him. You'll not make idols, and you'll not lift up his name to vanity. Now, that can be, the uh, uh, rabbis pointed out that in the Old Testament, there were five different ways that you can lift his name to vanity. But one of the ways that you lift his name to vanity, uh, you take his name in vain, is you apply his name to an idol, breaking commandment two and commandment three. Okay, so this is, this is just one of the things. And I listed all the places. I don't think I, I think I caught all the ones where they were using it in the, in the first way. Uh, but look at the prophets. The prophets love to call the unfaithful Israelites harlots, whores. They've, they've gone whoring after other nations. Now, sometimes that's very literal uh, in the pagan religions, in their idolatry. The uh, one thing that they, they did, they practiced sexual acts in their idolatry. Leviticus 18, if you've ever read that one, that one's a list of all the sexual sins. Well, many, many of those are associated with pagan rites, okay? Uh, bestiality, incest. Just, you, you can read Leviticus 18 for yourself. You, you, but um, sometime read... Jeremiah chapter 3 and 4. Just horrendous ideas associated with this. So, so who is the harlot? Is, it, is the harlot the people of God? But if you look at verse 6, they're the victims. We'll come back to this one in a second. The other way of understanding harlot in the Old Testament. And I have two passages that use it this way. Some people suggest a third one, but I can't find anything in that passage that uses this term. But in Isaiah 23 and Nahum chapter 3, verse 4, it's used of pagan kings and their empires. Let's look in Isaiah 23, verses 15 through 18. Now, make you open your Bible here. Uh, Isaiah 23, verse 15. Now in that day, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years. Like the days of one king. At the end of the 70 years, it will happen to Tyre as in the song of the whore, the harlot. Okay. Nice terminology. Take your heart, walk about the city, oh, forgotten harlot. Pluck the strings, hell skillfully, and men, with men, sing many songs. Can't sing this. That you may be remembered. Okay, and then he gets back, quit singing. Whatever that song was, it was, must have been a popular song. Uh, it will come about at the end of the 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre. Then she will go back and to her harlot's wages, and will play the harlot with all the kingdoms on the face of the earth. Her gain and her harlot's wages will be set apart to the Lord. It will not be stored up or hoarded, but her gain will become sufficient food and choice attire for those who dwell in the presence of the Lord. Okay, so it's a rather strange text, but notice the king of Tyre is called a harlot. Okay, so that's one way that people are going to do this one in Revelation. It's not that the people of God... 
That's another way some people interpret it. But it's the kings of the earth. These kings who bring about wickedness. Okay. Um, second one, many waters. I already looked at that one. You look at, last, at verse 15. Seven heads and ten horns. It's associated with the beast, and it's associated with the devil, and so this being, whoever it is, that outward appearance, magnificent. I would like to see someone dressed like this. I'd like, you know, just to see it. You know, it's just amazing about a wealth. Okay, so it has this outward appeal. But I love what the picture of what's in the cup, her sins, abominations. Now, I wrote the Greek word there. I like saying this word. I put it in English characters. This is uh, for my students when I taught at the university. So some of them had Greek. And uh, Listen to how you pronounce this word. This is hard to say in English. <laughs> Bedeligma. 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 Okay, the BD in a row. You see that? Bedelgma. And uh, one, one view of this word, we really are, it, 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 we translate it abomination, but some people think, not everybody, but I, I like this just because it makes good preaching material. Bedelgma is, uh, is what we call an onomatopoeia, uh, a word that, that imitates a sound. And my one teacher explained it this way, Bedelegma, you're throwing up. So if you want to know what makes God, Bedelegma, what, what makes God throw up what they were doing. It's um, unclean things of, their, of her immorality. Well, that one could cover any number of things uh, from everything from the worship of the leader to uh, the worship of the state, to the worship of idols, uh, to sexual perversion. Um, one of the things that uh, I saw a study on once was a guy did a study on various world leaders and some of their sexual perversions on there. Why did I read this? Except for stuff like this, you know. and. Uh, you're standing there saying, oh, man, what type of leaders do we have in this world? Okay. Um, so, but the one that's clear is they were drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. So those were her sins. Okay, now, how do we interpret this? This is something that people have argue and argue and argue about. I'll give you my interpretation. I take a rather broad interpretation of it. The first one is Imperial Rome. The early church fathers, when they read this, and by church fathers we mean the guys in the first three centuries of the church, when they saw this they said, that's Rome. That's Rome. And it does fit Rome, but it fits more than Rome, is my answer. It, see, it fits world leaders throughout the ages. The second interpretation was um, the Catholic Church. Now, I'm just saying this is how people interpret it. Believe it or not, many Catholics interpreted it this way. I was reading on this a few years ago, around A.D. 1000. I don't have the exact date here. couldn't find the article. I have it at my house, but I've got to get my library together and I'm going to give it away, but anyway, but around AD 1000, the popes were so bad that people were saying, the pope is the Antichrist, okay? They were saying this, um, and um, Protestants later picked this up. Early Protestant interpretation, they would call the, the Catholic Church that whore of revelation, the one that rides on the beast. The beast, they would say, is Rome, and the whore is the Catholic Church. Even in our group, what we call the, a restorationist view, we're not the only ones, but for example, Alexander Campbell in his debate with Archbishop Purcell down in Cincinnati, very famous debate, uh, 
he pounded this idea. I believe that the horror of Revelation is the Catholic Church. Uh, okay. At least at times, she did what the whore is pictured as doing. She, if she wasn't the whore, she was at least at times acting like the whore. I, um, one of my, I, I don't know, I, I have to admit I cry sometimes. I get moved by stuff really badly. Uh, one friend uh, who's a street preacher came over today and he and I were talking. He's also a preacher, but he gets out on the street. And he and I used to go over, go out on the street. And um, we would, the, the cool way to witness, I've done this with several people, but you go out on the street and I look this way, he stands over here and he looks this way. And we talk at, fairly good levels of talking, and we talk to each other. And um, we've had people stop and listen to us. We went into a restaurant that's no longer in existence, but Quebec Gardens, I don't know if any of you have ever seen Quebec Gardens down in Cincinnati off Queen City. But anyway, Quebec Gardens on Quebec Avenue. But uh, we went in there one day, and we, we always look, we'd always look before we would sit down, and we sat down in this one seat, and we said, oh, there's a guy right over there. It looks like he's getting ready to leave. We sat down, and we started talking. The girl waited on us. We got our food. We ate our food. We kept talking and talking and talking. And uh, anyway, uh, this guy never left. When we got up to leave, he got up to leave. He listened to us the whole time. I've done this multiple times. What was I going to say about Jackie? That wasn't... What I was going to say about him, but, uh, uh, well, but, oh, anyway, I cry at times, and today when I saw Jackie, I haven't seen him for a couple years, I, I cried, I got to admit this, out of joy for seeing Jackie, but I remember one time reading a book, and I don't usually cry over books, but I re read a book by Myron Augsburg. Augsburger on, I forget, I keep thinking it was 10 who dared, but number 10 isn't right. I always said it's the 10 who dared, but I think it was 10 of the characters in the book I liked. It's something who dared, but Myron Augsburger. And in that book, it told about the things that the, um, the, the brethren and the Mennonites, they were they were not Protestants, they weren't Catholics, they were the other people. Uh, hard to explain Christianity. They're not Protestants, they're not Catholics, but they were the others. And uh, this story is about how both the Catholics and the Protestants, especially the Catholics, would slaughter them. And when you read that part of the book, you said, I see how a person gets this idea that the whore is the second stage of the Roman Empire. The beast, the big beast and the little beast is the first part. This is on your sheet. Um, um, you get how people did this. And then you have the, the beast and the whore, which would be the Catholics and the, uh, at least the medieval Catholics and the, the Roman Empire. And then, of course, then you have the end time beast, which will come to the beast and the false prophet. Are these three stages of church history? Interesting view. Um, I, I put an article there. It's called the Ada de Fe. And uh, I'm not advocating that this is an image of the Catholic Church. I'm just saying I want you to see why people would do this. The Ada de Fe... Um, is, that's a Portuguese term, but it was about how they would take heretics and burn them publicly, execute them. 
And when you read those things, you say, oh, I understand why someone living through that would say this, okay? And that this is not an attack on Catholics. I'm just trying to explain how people have interpreted this. Um, so a third view, number three there at the bottom, is that this is the end time antichrist. It's not something that has happened yet, but it is the end time antichrist, okay? Now this view, um, I don't disagree with a whole lot. I'm going to make a slight modification to it in my understanding of this. This is, depends on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's go back there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses, starting with verse 3. Okay, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, this one isn't said in terribly symbolic language. This is more of a literal presentation. Uh, beginning with verse 3, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come about. Um, what's he talking about? What will not come about? What's well, the day of the Lord? Some people were saying, oh, we've already seen the day of the Lord, and you've missed it. I, I like this. You're, you're not a part of the day of the Lord. You know, you missed it, buddy. Okay. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. Now, there has to be a great apostasy before the day of the Lord comes. That's one of the signs of the end. Well, that would assume that there's a great conversion of the world. We'll come back to this in one of the later lectures. And the man of lawlessness, now people will call him the Antichrist. It doesn't use that term here, is revealed. The son of destruction okay, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. Now, this sounds like what the beast is, the, uh, the whore on the back of the beast is the Antichrist, um, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God. Now, is the temple of God there the temple in Jerusalem? Some people see it that way. Or is it meaning in the church? This guy takes over the church. Ooh, Interesting displaying himself as being God. Do you, do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? So, okay, I wish I'd have been there. I would understand this passage a lot better. Okay, I was telling you these things. And you know what restrains him now. So something holds him back so that in his time he will be revealed. See, he's got to be something greater than just a human. So some people think that the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, whatever you want to call him, if you want to call him the Antichrist, that's fine. He's some spiritual force because he exists in John's day. He's there, but he's coming. So some think it's Satan's spirit itself, you know, inhabiting a man. Uh, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. So something is restraining him. And there's a big argument about what restrains him. My ultimate idea is it's God. And God stops restraining him. Then that lawlessness will be revealed, okay, whom the Lord... Now, this is the important part for a thing. Now, notice when the man of lawlessness totally is revealed, his full quote-unquote, glory. It's not glory, but what happens to him? Whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth. And one way I've, I've heard this in translating, and it's possible uh, to translate it this way. You can translate it breath, or you can translate it... <sighs> What's it take to kill this guy? Just the... The breath of his mouth. You know, it's, it's a trivial, trivial thing to God. He's all powerful, but it doesn't take much for God to kill him. Now, you can also translate that the spirit of his mouth, that the Holy Spirit calms out and the Holy Spirit kills him. That's another way of reading this. Um, either way, I like. Um, 
and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. So it's going to be the second coming that puts a final end to this thing. That's why some people think that the, what we're dealing with here is some type of image of the end time antichrist. Number four, and here's how I'm going to read this. I take this as all evil world oppressors that culminate in that final evil leader, you know. They were all whores riding the beast. I take the beast as the empires and the whore as the leaders of those things. And uh, it just get, they just keep coming back. If you look at history, what kept coming back? Whether it was religious leader or whether it was political leader, you get rid of one and another one comes back. And for example... Um, I used to have this, and I don't know what happened to this pile of literature. I had some pre-World War II literature written by Christians. They thought, he is the ultimate, uh, that Hitler is the ultimate antichrist. And I can see why someone believes that. Why? Because he was extremely nasty, especially when he started killing the Jews and Christians and, and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, he really hated the Jehovah's Witnesses, not because they knocked on his door, <laughs> He just hated them because he wouldn't go along with them, and uh, he made them pay, okay? Um, so, but it, I, I take it, sort of, this is sort of a, a thing between several of these former views. I think it includes Imperial Rome. I think it includes the bad popes, who even the Catholics called the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, and that, but... Uh, I think it includes people like Adolf Hitler. I think it includes this. But it ultimately culminates in this great world leader who the Lord himself will kill. Okay? Um, that's one way of reading it. Am I sure? No. Sorry. Okay. Back of the sheet. Now, you, they put it on upside down, so you have to turn it over and then turn it around. Um, on the back of the sheet... Uh, we have an explanation of the beast and the whore. This is the second part of the chapter. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. Now, John, remember, is divinely inspired. He's standing there. What in the world did I just see? And the angel said to me, why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Here is the mind which has wisdom. I obviously don't have enough. The seven heads and seven mountains on which the woman sits. They are seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, the other is not yet come, and when he comes, he'll remain a little while. The beast which was and is not is himself and also an eighth. So, I'm going to take that eighth one as that final manifestation of evil, what Paul calls the man of lawlessness, okay? Um. And is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they will receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. Now, obviously, this isn't literal, because so what? We, we've almost spent an hour here in this class. Their reign would be over. What, in Revelation, when numbers are small, it means really short period of time, and when they're big, it means a long period of time. If you notice, Satan gets usually little numbers with him, three and a half years, seven years, 42 months. But when God gets a number, for example, Satan's thrown in prison for a thousand years, that's a big number. God lives unto the ages of the ages, forever and ever. Um, we will inherit everlasting life. He gets everlasting condemnation. That's the biggest period of time he gets is when he goes to hell. Satan. Okay, so um, it means a short time. They have one purpose. They give their power and authority to the beast. These will wage war against the lamb. 
how in the world do you fight someone who's in heaven to fight against his people? They fight the ideas of Christ, and the Lamb will overcome them. In other words, at his second coming, he... I love that. Voices here. Don't want the ceiling to fall on me. Okay, uh, because now... The Lamb will overcome because Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and those who are with him are called the chosen and the faithful. Now, this is an interesting thing. Notice the titles that we give Jesus. The false being, that what we're going to call the whore, has all these magnificent names, magnificent attire. But who is Jesus? He is Lord of Lords. Now, um, I have a comment on this one. This phrase, Lord of Lords, only appears twice in the Old Testament. In both times, it is applied to God himself. So who is Jesus? He is Lord of Lords. Now, this is one of those statements about the deity of Christ. This is one of the hard things to explain, how there's one God and yet... Uh, You have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm not smart enough to answer that question. I don't think too many people are. But if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. Okay. This is the only other place besides in the Psalms. I don't know why I didn't put the Psalm reference down. It doesn't say much more. But this is a better reference here. Look in Deuteronomy 10, verse 17. For the Lord your God is the God of gods. Now, what does that mean, God of gods? Well, it means he's the greatest. If I'm, a, if I'm the teacher of teachers, that means I'm the greatest teacher. Okay, the God of gods. He is the one who is supreme on anything you can call a God. And he is the Lord of lords, the great and mighty and awesome God who does show does not show partiality nor take a bribe. Okay, that's a great verse. But if you, oh, I did put that psalm down. Sorry, Psalm 136, verse 3. Um, it is also used in uh, 1 Timothy one time, but it's used in Revelation 19, 16, again of Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's Lord of Lords. Um, to me, that's a very clear statement that they understood that Jesus is somehow God. Great mystery that they haven't explained. We'll figure it out when we get there. Maybe God will have a class for us and say, okay, don't listen to Dan. Here's the explanation of it. And we still won't understand. <laughs> okay. Um, and King of Kings. Now, notice it gives two titles to him. King of Kings. Now, this always appears with Lord of Lords in the book of Revelation. Who is Jesus? He's Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Interesting. And who are with him? Um, the called and chosen and faithful. And I did have, I thought I put down some references for those, but I didn't. So, those are all terms in the New Testament for the people of God. Here's the thing. We may be killed, our blood may be shed, but we are with God. See, this is the thing that we should take hope in. And uh, I'm not going to volunteer like some early Christians did when they say, okay, we're going to have the lions in the arena. Anyone uh, know any Christians? And this guy says, I am. Some Christians have actually volunteered to go to the arena because they thought it was an instant ticket to heaven to die for the faith. And I'm not going to do that. Uh, other Christians said, no, you don't do that. And they always use the example of the Apostle Paul when the Apostle Paul was in Damascus and they were going to kill him and they put him in a basket and lowered him over a wall and he got out of there. Now, there came a time when Paul said, hey, I've got to go to Rome. I'm going to stand before Caesar. Uh, and he appealed to Caesar. And to Caesar he went. And uh, he eventually died. According to the tradition of the church, he died in Rome. Um, it's 
in the theology part of this passage, I like two things about this. Um, I've read this from several people, thought of it myself, but read it from several other people and said it must be a good thought. <laughs> if you think of something, someone else thinks the same thing. Uh, what does evil often do? It imitates Christ. If you notice in this passage, um, the beast was and is not and is to come. You see, um, death, burial, resurrection, you know, Christ, you know. And if you look early in the book, um, uh, he who was, speaking of God, and is and is to come. See, they imitate God in their presentation of self. This is why it's so heinous about worldly powers. They think they're God. Okay, and then um, if you, I give you some passages there, you can read those on your own. Um, but here's the thing. Christ will ultimately destroy the beast. And the Antichrist will be destroyed, 2 Thessalonians 2.8. We read this earlier. Then that lawlessness will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath or the spirit or the puff of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Uh, we can't get rid of it. Evil empires will exist until the end. And what we have to do is be faithful unto death, and he will give us a crown of life. Now, the beast and the whore... This is a weird part of the text. Uh, he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Okay. And the ten horns which you saw and the, and the beast, these are, hate the harlot and will make her desolate. Who's going to kill the whore? The beast is. Naked and will eat her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put in their hearts to execute his purpose by having common purpose and by giving them their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman who you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Okay. Now, um, we notice the word waters, that's he interprets it. But the purpose, I like verse um, They think they are united in their purpose, but look, go back to verse 13. Uh, they, these have one purpose, these ten kings. They will give their power and authority to the beast. But God, in verse 17, for God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose in giving their kingdom to the beast, and the God, words of God will be fulfilled. Okay, now... The theology is real simple. Evil turns on itself. This, to me, is terribly important. Um, oh, it, you know, one of the things that evil keeps saying, oh, we just need to get whatever. They can't unite. They're evil men. You look at great world leaders. Adolf Hitler. I, loved, I read a lot on Adolf Hitler in my life. And one of the things before his death, who was planning his death? Well... There were people in Germany who opposed him who were planning his death, but his own people were planning to kill him. Uh, they wanted him out of the way at, at one point because they thought they could make peace with the Allies. See, they, they think they are a united people, but they're not. United behind one leader, they're not. God's purpose is to have evil turn on itself. And we also see God's sovereignty. He controls even... When you give yourself to evil, God has a purpose for you. Uh, sometime read the book of Exodus, the first 12 chapters, God hardening Pharaoh's heart. Actually, 7 through 12. First, Pharaoh hardens his own heart, first six times. Then the next six times, Pharaoh hardens, I mean, first six times, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And then the next six times, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. See, God had a purpose for that guy. Now, I can't explain all the ins and outs of that, how it's fair, but I know Pharaoh was an evil man to begin with. 
And when God hardened him, he showed that he was an evil man. And what happens here is these guys are evil men, and God is going to bring them to destruction. So this is, a, in some ways, a very depressing chapter, but it's worth knowing that our God is in control. And that's why I, I like this end of this book, if you get out your first page. Um, yeah, we have A, the harlot rides the beast. Point B, an angel descends. And the Greek word is katabino. And the end of the uh, the end of Babylon, the great the great world empire, whatever that actually is, I don't know. Uh, and but then you go down to B prime. Wh where do we end up? We end up with a great city, not the the city of the beast, but the the new Jerusalem. We end up with there. That's where we want to be. And then uh, instead of a harlot have God's bride, which is his people, and God's tender relationship with his people through eternity. And people say, well, why does God ask me to go through this? I don't know. How does that sound? I know answers to this question that people give. My one Italian neighbor, I love that lady. I can't remember her name. This was 50 years ago. She would say to us boys, you know, I can't, I can't imitate Italian people speaking. I try it. But life is a test. And then we had a Jewish neighbor, and she and the Jewish neighbor were talking one day. And they're both saying, life is a test. God wants to us of our own free will to give ourselves to him, even if it means suffering for the sake of Christ, suffering at the hands of these world powers, Oh, they may look great on the outside. Their cup is filled with the wrath of God. Things that will call for the wrath of God upon them. But don't prepare to meet the Antichrist. I keep coming back to this. Prepare to meet the Christ. He is our hope. He is our salvation in the end. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I give you thanks for helping us to read Scripture. May we pay attention, to Father, to what it means to be a Christian. May we walk in ways that glorify you. They may anger the world. Father, we know that they do not anger you. We know that what worldly leaders who are evil men do, and we know that you are angered by those who follow them, and you are angered at them. We pray, Father, for our faithfulness. But Father, we also pray for the internal work of your, your spirit in our lives so that we would be willing and able to withstand these evil days. We pray through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.